that. I've never seen the righteous forsaken it, nor his seed begging bread. What a wonderful word to live by. Come on, put your hands together. Hey, we are the righteous of God. Situations unfold. A lot of places met all kinds, but there's one thing that stays on my mind. Out of all the things I've done, all the places I've gone, and the things I've seen, said I never seen the right. still works 
the blood of Jesus, it still works. It's never lost its power, and it never will. And it never will. I'm happy for the blood today. I'm excited for the blood. It sanctifies me. He's kept me yes, God. through the blood of Jesus, the through the power of, of his son. We thank you, God. Hallelujah for the blood. Anybody Lord, happy yes, about God. the blood? Come on, let's yes, raise God. your hands, yes, toot your horns. If you're Lord. excited about the blood yes. of Jesus, it's never lost its power. Hallelujah. Hallelujah oh, for God. the blood. It still works. His blood still works. His blood still works, and I'm glad to report that it never lost its power. Yes, it works. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. His blood still works, and I'm glad. To report yes, that it never yes. lost Long. its power. Yes, it works. Oh, no. I've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah, yeah. This blood still works, and I'm here to testify. testify. God is not dead. He is still alive. Hallelujah. Blood of his blood. Way back. How we feel is the same blood. It's working out. Oh, his blood redeemed. Hallelujah. From the stain of sin.
2,000 years ago, God sent Jesus to us. We were sinking deep in sin. And we were going through so much that God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet. And because of his patience and because of his kindness, he said, this is what I will do in this season. I will divest myself of my visible glory and I will send myself. And he sent Jesus Christ. That is love, the epitome of love, the ultimate of love is Jesus Christ. Come on, put your hands together and bless God. Let's bless God in this place on today. Amen, 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 amen. We thank God once again for all of you who are here on today. We thank God for our viewing audience, our streaming audience. We thank God for our conference call at nine o'clock. This is a great season to be alive and well. Amen, amen, amen. I call your attention to Nehemiah chapter number eight. Nehemiah chapter number eight. And we want to look at verses one through 12, but the emphasis of our message on today will be verses one through three, Nehemiah chapter eight. This is the seventh part of our series, True Ministry Reset. And for the next three weeks, we're just going to simply talk about getting ready for worship. Getting ready for worship. Getting ready for worship. Nehemiah chapter eight, Nehemiah chapter eight. And we want to look at verses one through 12. Uh, but our focus today will be verses 1 through 3, getting ready for worship. Again, we thank Brother Kevin and Brother Joel and our ushers, our greeters, our security, our deacons, and the team that helps make this worship beyond the walls what it is. Our praise team, we thank God for you. And uh, God is doing something great in this season. Amen. We also want to acknowledge our visitor on our guests on today, rather, and we thank God for you being here with us. Amen, amen, amen. Having so many other places to choose to worship, you found your way here to True Light Baptist Church. We're so excited. Nehemiah chapter 8, Nehemiah chapter 8. Now, if you just be patient with us on today, uh, we, we're going to do our best to bless you with the word. You've already been blessed with the word through song. And then uh, we'll see what other blessing God has in store for you on today. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 through 12. Now just go along for the reading and uh, let's see what God has to say. Verse number 1. And all of the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until the midday before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all of the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Now listen carefully. And Ezra the scribe stood up on the pulpit of wood and with him was some men with big names. Amen. Verse number five now says, and Ezra opened the book in the sight of all of the people, for he was above all of the people. Let's say that again. And Ezra the scribe opened the book in sight of all of the people, for he was above all of the people. And when he opened it, all of the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all of the people answered, amen, amen, with their hands lifted up and their bowed, they bowed their heads and worshiped with their faces to the ground. And then verse 7, other men with other big names 
and they said the Levites caused the people to understand the law and the people stood in their place. Verse 8, so they read in the book of the law God distinctively and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And then Nehemiah, which is the Tishireth, and Ezra, the priest of the scribe and the Levites that taught the people, said unto all of the people, this day is holy unto the Lord your God, more not, nor we. For all of the people wept when they heard these words of the law. Then he said unto them, go your way, eat and eat the fat, drink the sweet sin portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto your Lord, neither be ye sorrowful. For the Lord, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all of the people saying, hold your peace. For the day is holy and neither be ye grieved. And verse 12 says, and all of the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth because they understood the words that were delivered unto them. Father God, again, we lift up your name above every other name. We thank you, dear God, for your miraculous works and all of the things we have seen you do in our lives and in others. Now, God, as we rid our mind of all earthly thoughts and focus our attention on you, allow the word to be fresh, allow it to be with accuracy, simplicity, and truth, that these, your people, can hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For the next few moments, we want to speak from the subject, getting ready for worship. In order to have a full and great appreciation of Nehemiah chapter 8, you must hit rewind and understand Nehemiah chapters 1 through 7. So what is happening here now, as we look at the backdrop of this book, you remember that Jerusalem has been destroyed. The temples have been challenged. The wall of the city has been torn down. In chapter 1, Nehemiah gets the word that his homeland is in trouble. The Bible says now once he gets the word in chapter number 1, he starts to pray at the end of chapter number two, or 1 going into chapter number 2 what he has heard about his homeland and what he has heard about the city and their inability to worship has troubled Nehemiah that now his whole countenance has changed that even the queen sees him because he is the king's cupbearer. When the queen sees him, she says, what is wrong with you, Nehemiah? Something is pulling on your countenance. So Nehemiah begins to explain to the queen what is going on in Jerusalem. The queen has a conversation with her, her husband, the king, King Artaxerxes, and they say unto Nehemiah, what can we do for you? And Nehemiah now asks for a leave of absence in order for him to go back home to take care of his people. So in chapter number two, he's in prayer, chapter one in prayer, chapter two in prayer, chapter three, he stops praying and gets into action. I just want to drop this on some of us as we move through this. Too many of us spend too much time praying because when God has answered, we need to move. Many times we don't want to move because it's not the answer that we wanted from God in the first place. When Nehemiah prays, he spends time in prayer, but once God answers his prayer, he moves. He now has a conversation with the queen and the king, and they ask him, what do you need? He said, I'm going to need some money. I'm going to need some assistance. I'm going to need some wood. So then the queen and the king writes a letter for Nehemiah to go through the land and to gather all of the supplies he need to go down to Jerusalem and to help rebuild the wall of the city. The wall of the city being torn down is one thing, 
but understanding what it really means is something else. It means that that city is vulnerable to the attack of any and every enemy. And so what Nehemiah feared the most is that these other tribes would try to kick the people of God while they're down. I don't know who I'm talking to, but all of us have experienced that at least one down, uh, one time. It, it, it's okay. It's okay to be down, but, but don't kick somebody when they're down. I mean, we're supposed supposed to know better that when someone is down our job is to help them up because the only reason you and I are in the positions we're in today is because when we were down somebody helped us and so Nehemiah is troubled because he believed these other tribes that they have been in battle with will try to kick Jerusalem while they are down so now we're moving through chapter 2 and now into chapter 3 Nehemiah has reached his destination and he's starting to rebuild the wall. He calls on the men of that town and he simply says this, I don't need you to build the whole wall. I only need you to build the wall that protects your home. Because everyone knows that if a man is worth anything, he's going to fight for his own family. And so the Bible says that the men had a spear in one hand and bricks and straw in the other hand. They had knives in one hand and wood planks in the other hand. So as they were building, they were keeping their eye out for the enemy. And this is what you and I have to be sensitive to because whenever people of God try to build something, the enemy is all always trying to tear it down. So we can't become so holier than thou and so church and heavenly minded that we forget about the enemy. And the enemy comes and shows up in all kinds of of different forms. The enemy may come to church one Sunday morning in a dress. The enemy may come in a three-piece suit. The enemy may come serving as a leader. And if you're not careful, the enemy may even come and stand in the pulpit. We have to be careful and always prayed up. So chapter one, two, and three, now we're in motion. Now there are people who are starting to hate on what is happening and the walls are being rebuilt. The momentum is being restored. The morale is rising. The people are beginning to fall back in love with their leader and trust the people who are in leadership. Now in chapter 3 and 4, the haters come out of the woodworks and they come to the forefront by the name of Tobias and Sanballat. So what they do, because they don't like what Nehemiah is doing, they invite Nehemiah to stop kingdom building and to get off focus, get off of the course and engage them in a conversation in the city of Ono. And so Nehemiah said, you want me to come to Ono? And my answer is, oh no. My brothers and sisters, is we have to realize that there's certain times that we can't stop what God has called us to do to get off and get connected and to move about our own way. We have to stay focused with the word of God. So now in chapter four, Nehemiah and the men have come together and they're working and they're building the wall. And Tobiah and Sanballat, it tells them that we need you to come down. And Nehemiah say, I can't come down because I'm doing a great work. In other words, I'll deal with you after I finish doing the work of the Lord. So now as we move out of chapter 4, 5, and 6, the wall is being rebuilt almost in its entirety. And they begin to rebuild the temple and create a place for the people to worship. Now, look at the parallel. These people have not been able to worship for a mighty long time. 
there was no public gatherings because they have not been able to worship. Sounds a little bit like us. We have to gather outside and, and they wanted to come back into the temple and so on their way back into the temple, they have a parking lot worship beyond the walls that you can see in verse number one that says and they came down by the city gate. They were not yet ready to get back in the temple but they were getting ready in their mind and in their emotion that we are a little bit closer now than we were at the beginning of the year and so Nehemiah now steps back so Ezra can step forward now I need you to understand this because although the book is called Nehemiah it's about Nehemiah's work but Nehemiah is not really the prophet Nehemiah is the director of the helps ministry and when Nehemiah sets the stage for the helps ministry and do everything, Nehemiah then steps out of the way so the preacher can get where he needs to be in order to preach the word for the word to go forward. What you will discover in too many churches is that people in the helps ministry actually get in the way of the preacher and the word going forth. Can I get an amen? They get in the way so Nehemiah and that's why he's so brilliant because he could have said you're going to listen to me he could have said you need to understand me he could have said you need to hear what I have to say because oh by the way I built this up in the first place but because of his humility, because of his understanding of the assignment, once Nehemiah did his part, watch this, he got out of the way and said, now Ezra, it's time for you to do your part. How many times have we interfered with the progress of situations because we want to do everybody's part? How many times the mama want to be the mama and the daddy? How many times the daddy want to be the daddy and the mama? How many times the mama and the daddy want to be the kids and partner in parenting instead of being parents that show the children the way? How many times do we do things that don't line up with the word of God and then we're upset because we do not get the results? And so my brothers and sisters, I love this brother Nehemiah. If you want to study leadership, study Nehemiah because when Nehemiah does what he's supposed to do he then steps to the side when only the others can do what they can do so in verses 1 2 and 3 as they get prepared to worship they're not back in the temple but they're at the city gate so number one the Bible tells me as we get ready to worship that the people were committed to meet they were committed to to meet they were committed to meet they came down they looked like one man in the street this is the same language that is used in Ezekiel chapter 37 when the Bible says and the bones came together bone upon bone that when all of the bones came together they looked like a great arm it's the same language that when all of the people came together that was a oneness with their presence so the people were committed to come together. And so we have to make up our mind, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? We're going to trust God. Are we going to go in? Are we going to be faithful? What are we going to do? Are we going to commit? I'm not pressuring you to do either because it's your choice. But when we're doing in-person worship, it'll be streaming live for everyone. But we're going to do everything we can to keep everyone safe. But you have to make a commitment. What are you going to do? If you're going to look at it online, look at it online. If you're going to come to church come to church but don't come to church and complain that you should have stayed online don't come to church and say the music too loud I could have stayed online don't come to church and say the, 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 the atmosphere is too cold I should have stayed at home because when you're committed to be here you have to be committed to be here number two it says in verse number two and Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation both of men and women and all of them could hear watch this with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month so not only were the people committed to meet but the preacher was committed to minister so many times you have one of those entities missing people come to church to have church but the preacher not ready to preach 
oh, the preacher is ready to preach, but the people haven't prepared themselves to have church. See, preparation for church goes beyond pulling out clothes on Friday or Saturday night and making sure the pumps match with the purse, and making sure the earrings match with the rouge, and making sure the blouse and all of the, the accessories are together. No, that's outward stuff. Can I help you? God ain't even looking at that. He don't even care if that stuff match. What he is looking at is our hearts. So when I prepare to worship with the same energy, I prepare my clothes. I also prepare my inner man. I prepare my mind. I prepare my emotions. I pray for the preacher. I pray for the word to be authentic. I pray for the music. I pray for my brothers and sisters who are coming in. And I pray that when they leave, they will be better leaving than when they pulled up. I need you to understand that the people were committed to me and the preacher was committed to minister. But then thirdly, as I take my seat, they were prepared to be consecrated in that moment. I want you to think about that. They were prepared to be consecrated in that moment. How do you know that? Because in verse number three, look at what it says. The last clause of verse number three, it says, and the ears of all of the people were attentive unto the book of the law. I want you to think about that. People's ears were attentive to the book of the law. Now, not this church, but the church your cousins go to. How many times have they been able to come home and tell you everything about what happened at church, but when you ask them what did the preacher preach, all they can say, oh, I'm not sure. Uh, he preached about something. I think it was love. But they can tell you what everybody else was saying. They can tell you what everybody else was wearing. They can tell you what some people look like. They can tell you how they acted when they walked around. But they could not tell you what the word was about. I have to ask the question. If you're not coming for the word, what are we coming for? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? My wife had a desire for a particular dish on yesterday. And most of you know I live on the northeast end of town, not too far from the airport, on the northeast end of town. And she had uh, a desire for a particular dish. And this restaurant is either downtown or way down in the southeast end of town. So when she had a request for this particular dish, it wasn't an issue because my, if I keep her happy, then the house is happy. Amen. And so I, I pulled everything together and I said, well, let me make sure. And I went down there. I traveled and I'm making my call and I'm ordering my food. I was a little disappointed because one of the things she wanted was not on the menu. And that was the most important thing she wanted. And I wanted to turn around and not go at all because I'm saying, what am I going for if you don't really have what I need? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Then I called the other place and they said, yes, we have everything you need. I go and I get it. My point is, if I'm not coming for worship and I'm not coming for word, what am I coming for? That's the only reason I get up on Sunday morning. That's the only reason I put a suit, a coat, and a tie on and stand in sun and preach the word because I am fully aware that those of you who make this commitment are only coming for the worship and only coming for the word. There's no play in this. There's no show in this. You're not sitting in hot cars. You're not sitting with the windows cracked. You're coming here asking, is there a word from the Lord my brothers and sisters we have to ask ourselves am I coming to consecrate myself in that moment by listening attentively I want you to see it I want you to see it now we'll be here the next three weeks so I'm done with phase one of this but I want you to hear it verse number three again and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday so first of all they weren't even concerned about how long church was see when you come for worship and you come for the word now here's the good news we try to do it in 60 to 75 minutes but what if it was 90 
What if it was two hours? What if the Holy Spirit just fell one Sunday and I couldn't preach and the choir couldn't stop singing and you couldn't stop praising? When we leave there, would we be saying, Lord, they had church too long? Or would we be saying, Lord, thank you for showing up like you haven't shown up in a while? See, my brothers and sisters, we have to ask ourselves, what is this really about? So from the morning to the midday, they were sitting in attentively, uh, sitting with their ears attentive to the word of God. Now watch this. Before the men and the women, that those that could understand and the ears of all of the people were attentive unto the book of the law. So you will see it later next week, but what it literally is saying is that what should be happening every Sunday, every moment of worship, whenever we enter the presence of God, is that there should be worship and then there should be the word. And then those who do understand should walk alongside those who don't understand to make sure that all of us get the understanding that God wants us to have. I mean, you think about it. You think about it. Let me just throw out a subject and then I'll rush to my seat. If you say tithe, if you say tithe, and you just define that in the Bible, uh, Webster doesn't uh, have a whole bunch of definitions and A and B and C. It just has one definition. But if you were to ask a lot of people, a lot of people would come up with more than one definition. How is it that the Bible and the Webster Dictionary defines tide one way, but when it comes to us, we're more sophisticated than Webster and God, and we come up with all these kinds of definitions. That means we are hearing the word, but we're not necessarily attentive to the word, and we are walking away without the understanding. He says they were attentive unto the book of the law because the word, watch this, is the one thing that consecrate our minds, our lives. It sets us apart that we are able to live out our kingdom lives before men and God. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Before men and God. And so my brothers and sisters, what Nehemiah is doing now, he has gotten out of the way. Ezra, the priest, the scribe has stepped up and he is ministering to the people of God and preparing them so they will be prepared for the moment they enter the temple. My brothers and sisters, God has graced us since June of last year that this parking lot has been so kind to us. Do you realize all of those worship services, it never rained, it never snowed. Even at the beginning of the week, I started looking at the forecast. I saw that it got up to 60% chance of rain today. And I just kept praying. I said, God, some people don't believe you can pray good weather in and bad weather away. <laughs> but God, I'm just going to believe that if we can speak and the mountains be removed, if we can speak and lives be altered, that God, you can shift things and the atmospheric pressure can be shifted. And if there's going to be any precipitation, let it fall after 12 o'clock. That's nobody but the grace of God. That week in and week out, when we show up, this is the kind of weather we have. My brothers and sisters, God has been kind to us. This worship beyond the walls has anchored our ministry. Has anchored our ministry for over a year. I want to personally thank you for trusting the young preacher and saying we're going to follow our leader. As I said in the very beginning, I've never pastored through a pandemic. 
and you've never been a member through a pandemic. So everything we were doing was trial and error. It was an error, trial and error. But now, as we can slowly see the sun peeping through the clouds, the storm is almost gone. It's not gone yet, it's almost gone. And so we have to start praying, my brothers and sisters. As this Delta variant is moving, we have to start praying, my brothers and sisters. I don't care you've been vaccinated, that's great, but we still have to start praying that there's not another shutdown and that those who decided not to take the vaccine would, would re-evaluate that decision. It is starting to attack our younger population and we have to be mindful, we have to be sensitive, we have to be careful. I see some of you traveling and moving about and I know you have that longing, you have that social need, you have that desire to be around people. I get it, I understand it. But right now, for those of you who don't know, we have about four of our members today, this morning, at 1036, who are dealing with COVID. They're dealing with it as I preach. And we pray for them and their families right now. So my brothers and sisters, as we prepare, let's not only prepare for getting into church, but let's start praying for our brothers and sisters that they take care of themselves. That they continue to wash their hands and they continue to mask up. I heard a deacon say this on yesterday. He said the bottom line is, in order for us to remain safe in this season, we have to treat everyone like they have COVID. That way, we can come out of this better and better, my brothers and sisters. We're preparing to enter these walls, but I need you to start preparing. Be sensitive about where you're going, who you're going with. If you're in close proximity, still wear your mask. The sun is starting to peep through the clouds, but the storm, even though it's almost gone, it is not gone yet. We don't want to enter and then have to shut down. So I need you even now, every one of you under the sound of my voice, every one of you that can see me on this podium to start being sensitive of every action you take and how those actions can impact when we come back in these walls to worship God in spirit and in truth. So let's start practicing that today. Let's start practicing that today. Because when we start up, we don't want to stop. We want it full motion ahead. And so I challenge you on that. That's what Nehemiah is saying. Prepare in every way. We extend the invitation to our brothers and sisters who may be outside of the ark of safety, who do not have that relationship with Jesus Christ. Right now, my brother, my sister, all you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord. Say, God, I need you in my life. I repent of my sin. I ask you to be my Lord and my Savior to save me from this life of sin. And if you pray that prayer, you ask God to come in your heart. Now you have to have the faith to believe that you are saved. Father God, we thank you now for the opportunities you are giving us to lead by example. We thank you for this church, True Light Church, dear God, for the members who are first of all committed to you and then committed to this ministry. We thank you for their consistency and their faithfulness. And now God, 
as we participate in the administration of the Lord's Supper for the eighth time this year, we ask that you continue to bless all of our brothers and sisters who have served so diligently over this year. Now we ask that you bless the elements, the bread, the wine, and we understand that it's symbolic of your death, your life, your death, your resurrection. And so God, we thank you for that. Now God, with clean hands, clear minds and pure hearts, we join together to partake of the Lord's Supper. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.